Everyone, thanks for stopping by the Standards Weekly Check-In. I'm Colin, behind the camera we got Dylan. What's up? Today we're going to be getting into some staff picks, flipping through some new arrivals, recently priced records, and answering your questions left on the YouTube and Instagram page. So, we got a lot to get to, let's get started with some staff picks. Keeping this one short, because we got a lot of, like, some real good Q&As today. Um, I don't know, I, I uh, just listened to this like all weekend on repeat. Um, I, I think I'm like a, a late in life Stevie Wonder fan. I wasn't raised around his music, but it's frustrating how good he is, yeah, you know? Yeah, he's great. Frustrating getting into an artist that's universally beloved and acknowledged is great. It's like, have you heard of this guy, Stevie Wonder? A little deep cut, a little obscure, but yeah, it's phenomenal. I see the only like meaningful uh, thing I have to say about this other than uh, just what a, you know, I'm obviously great record it is. That song, Rocket Love, I didn't realize, uh, I feel like the Style Cancel kind of swiped that song for um, Shout to the Top, which is one of their big, big tracks. Uh, yeah, so if you know, if you don't know, uh, listen to those side to side. I did a Google search even. I wanted to see if like they got sued over it or whatever, because the Stevie Wonder camp seems to be fairly litigious about that. But no, spin, uh, spin, Rocket Love, spin, shout to the top from Style Council. Tell me if I'm crazy. I played it for you. you yeah, I mean, I kind of heard it. All right, but I don't know. There's some story. I guess you looked it up, so I don't know. Yeah, it didn't. It, didn't, it wasn't like yeah, they got sued or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. to me, it's just a, a sound like. What, what do you got for the people? Uh, I got suicidal tendencies. Never heard of a revolution. Uh, if you know me, uh, I'm very off brand for you, Dylan. Yeah, if you know me, I've never heard of suicidal tendencies, and uh, you know, I, I listened to this for the first time the other day, and gotta say, it's uh, really good. Um, let's see what they got on this one, dude. Oh, they just look cool. There's just some cool guys. Jeez, uh, I would say the best song for me personally would be. Uh, what's, what's Rocky? What's on Rocky's feet? <laughs> Are those command forces? <laughs> no, they look like Clarks. <laughs> what? Rocky? No. Oh, no, the drummer? Oh, oh they look like. what's going on there? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, I don't know. I think my favorite song would be Going Breakdown. That's just like a heavy stomper song, realistically. Uh, that's about it, though. Yeah, I that's can. Uh, it's, but it, I, think we've, I feel like we've talked about that. Best albums? Is that or, that or you? or? Uh, I always flip-flop between... Uh, Join the army and um, what's it called? How will I laugh? Yeah, how will I? I'm uh, I'm sort of between this one and how will I laugh. But join the army. It, this is the problem with, with loving uh, suicidal so much. Is how do you pick? How and do then you, you pick? choose that. So I choose that. Album I will say you can't bring me down. I can't. I can't give a nod to any any song. Any album. If any album that has that song on it is going to be that's the best song on it. Yeah. Put that song on. <laughs> you know. Abbey Road, and you can't bring me down. It's gonna be <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear it. Don't want to see that. <laughs> all right, let's get to the flip through here. I was listening to uh, one of your all-time favorite records, and one of my, I would say recent because I say probably like in the last five years, favorite record, um, Persistence of Time oh, from okay. the the group Anthrax. Yes. And uh, I was wondering, like, when does it get old? When does your favorite record get old? Like, when does it start to lose its impact? Like you don't start to hate it, but it just doesn't affect you. Are you still affected by Persistence of Time? Does it still get you juiced when you play it? Yeah, the intro of time. The, the clock. Oh, yeah, the, the ticking, and then yeah. once the riff starts kicking in, I'm like, damn it. It's so goddamn it, good. It really happens most of the time when I'm like watching a live vid, especially from that era. Right. They'll always open with that, and I'm like, I get so stoked. So it never, it, that, yeah. that's what makes a favorite album. Like if you were to ask me my favorite album, my, my answer for like a decade or so now has been uh, Brighter Than a Thousand Suns from Killing mm. Joke. Yeah. I, that's why I was decided it was my favorite album because I always want to hear it and it never gets old. Never, yeah. never like, I'm never, it's never like loses its impact. It's mm -hmm. always makes me feel something. It's, a, it's pretty, I don't, I, maybe I'm like projecting that Persistence of Time is like your favorite album. That's I would say it is. I'm trying like to think How of, many times do you play it? it, it, it but that's a, that's why it's your favorite. Any yeah. album, it's your favorite album because it never gets old. Right? Yeah, I would say since high school. It's always hit at least 20 times a year. Yeah. And like, I don't know what it is. I guess I framed this question wrong. Cause I would say, it's like, I, I had almost an anxiety, <laughs> like a fear. Yeah. Like a genuine, like genuinely stressed out that I would play this record too many times get over it and it, and it would start to lose its impact mm -hmm. even though i played it today and i thoroughly enjoyed it i was just like i was afraid i'm afraid of overplaying something in yes case it loses that spark but i guess that's why it's good it's because it never loses its spark yeah i sincerely cannot think of anything that like i i was into 
Yeah. And then like got over it. I think I realized the answer. I'm listening. For my answer anyway. Any Metallica record. That's you're, you're just burnt out on it. Yeah. It's, it's tough. It's weird. Yeah. Anyway. All right. We got a lot of really good questions on YouTube and the Instagram comments. So I'll get into that. I was, this is what I would, I've, I wanted since the beginning of this to have like kind of a, uh, a Q and A feel. It's good. Give me, give me prompts of uh, things to, to talk about here. Uh, so first question from Buenos Yargas off of YouTube: Do you see Discogs as a threat or an opportunity for brick and mortar stores? Um, I guess I would say neither. It's just Discogs is has been a paradigm shift um, in a big way. I've been like in the same way that eBay was a paradigm shift in a weird way just having like pop psych uh, before there was collector's frenzy um as like a way to catalog ebay prices that was a paradigm shift discogs i think you can take brick and mortar stores off the table and just talk about record collecting anyone selling a record record conventions people with like antique mall booths across the board discogs has changed everything um particularly if i had to pinpoint one if you want to call it just a, an effect not really positive or negative it's sort of a homogenization of, pro, of pricing and what i mean by that is in a and i i, I saw this change happening and uh like my, my 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 spidey senses started tingling as soon as i would see this like we in in even just the ebay dates right you would go to a record swap and there would be a guy with a bunch of let's say jazz records right and he has all his jazz records priced to the t of what they should be and go for and whatnot because that guy knows that market and then he would have let's say a stray you know uh megadeth record and just be you know have a five dollar price thrown on it because he doesn't really know that stuff and so he just puts whatever to get it out of the way and that would be kind of how you would quote unquote score come up and I feel like with Discogs being as accessible as it is and with the prices being as cataloged as they are, a lot of that has gone out of the way so that like, you know, the guy who has crates and crates of, you know, funk and soul records normally wouldn't really be caring about like, let's say, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a Cuban salsa record or, a, you know, a batch of weird death metal albums he has coming in. Now they're all priced exactly to the T. So it's a tool, and as far as brick and mortar stores specifically, I don't know a single store that doesn't sell on Discogs in some capacity, you know, um, not necessarily having all their stock up all the time, but in terms of like, I mean, I sell there uh, and it's a great place to sell for when you have records that are kind of kicking around that haven't been moving or you need to price stuff down and move it out or who knows what. There's a lot of reasons to use Discogs. and. I think in general with any tool, it's sort of how you use it and not necessarily threat or danger or necessarily benefit even because it's just a, a change. It's different. It's a pivot. That's how I see uh, Discogs. And let's see, what else do we got? Oh, uh, Matthew Atherton on YouTube asks, what are the best under the radar thrash metal albums nobody talks about? I have, a, I have, I have, I have one locked and loaded. I'll let you think about it for a second. This is, a, this is a Dylan question. Yeah. Yeah, you can save the Discogs brick and mortar talk for me. Don't you talk underrated thrash metal. My man behind the camera here. He's got some insight. Anyways, uh, the first one that came to mind when I, I read this was uh, this Swedish band, Cemeterium, who are in a way like a like a poor man's version of uh, anti-Semix circa like absolute country of Sweden. Um, so probably a little more in the crossover vein, but just really great like it's almost it's more hardcore or punk than it is thrash but i think it's just by pure ineptitude which is my favorite <laughs> um uh, brand of metal which is just accidental i guess anyways that's a really great uh record and uh, on the other end of the spectrum i thought of uh this band target who i believe are a german band um and they have an album like project human genesis really good like technical thrash i don't have a uh deep bench for technical thrash uh records i sort but um i totally worship at the altar of watchtower from texas and i like the really early meshuggah stuff like the first two albums and that uh target record is kind of right in the middle there in terms of like technical uh 
more technical playing, but it's still like fluid and not totally uh, up its ass musicianship wise. And yeah, I don't know. I don't. Those I think the both of those records are still really dirt cheap, so they haven't been totally blown out yet. Um, but yeah, those are my two. What do you What do you got for the for the people, Dylan? Uh, heavy sigh. Yeah, heavy sigh. No. Um, German thrash metal band Shaw okay. S H A H. They have an album called Beware. Funny picture of three skulls screaming at you. Uh, they're on fire. I, I can relate. Um, they're German. These are all like old school YouTube finds that I did back in like <laughs> high school. Um, atrophy, socialized hate. It's a good one. There we go. Yeah, dude. See, I'll say I have to. Yeah, these are these are under. If I if I haven't heard of them, I will agree that these are uh, under the radar. Um, thanks for the question. And then we have a uh, hardcore satanic off of Insta says uh, another cue. When is the market on all the thirty dollar re reissues of like the ET soundtrack You're going to run its course and cut out bin history repeat itself, brother? <laughs> uh, okay, so I think uh, misconception of sorts. Jeez, I don't I want I don't want to go on and on of this. The bottom line is it has to be it has to stop being profitable and it's wildly profitable. And I think it's wildly profitable because a lot of chain stores, which, you know, deep vinyl guys, they're not going to, they're not thinking about the Barnes and Nobles and the Urban Outfitters, but like those places don't have used copies of Simon and Garfunkel Sounds of Silence to put in the bin for five bucks. Like a place like mine does or any, you know, you or any record store really. So those kind of reissues specifically service that market. The other side of things is I have had records that I would use to put in that category of like, that's a $5 record, that's a $3 record, that's a dollar bin record, why are they reissuing that? I've seen that happen to, let's say the Steely Dan catalog, right? Like that band's popularity has, got, has spiked in a big way and Whereas I used to put those records out for $5, now I gotta be kind of stingy about them because they're not coming in with the frequency that they used to. And if I want copies to stick around, I have to kind of abide by the market. Frankly, I would be glad to pay, you know, maybe not. If I'm, pay if, if I'm putting it out for $30, that is a little too high. But like if I could get some Steely Dan reissues in like the mid $20 range, just so that I always have a copy on deck, I take it. So in a lot of ways, it's supply and demand. The demand has to run out and then the supply will run out. Another issue to keep in mind is that it's not really the labels cranking those out. Um, a lot of times it's just people who are licensing the music from the labels to press on vinyl. So you're looking at a world of like entrepreneurship almost, even, I don't know, I hesitate to say fandom. But if someone is a crazy Hall & Oates fan and is like, I insist that the Hall & Oates catalog get pressed on vinyl, even though to people who are, you know, regular vinyl buyers, they would say, don't, those are dollar bin records. Those are cheap records. Those are common records. They don't need to be reissued. As soon as someone gets that bug to do it and pays a licensing fee, it's going to get done and it's going to take up space in the pressing plant. And that's why your band can't get records pressed. Fun stuff, right? Um, and yeah, th so th and to close it out, we have a, a great question from uh, Punky and the Big Fish asks on Instagram, do you feel co collectors are looking for good music to listen to or collecting just for their retirement and value? That's a, I, I had to think about this for a long time. And I think um, in almost every sphere that I've been interested in, like comic books or, you know, clothes or shoes or whatever, there is this financial drive behind it and a sect that like thinks of these things as investments. Don't do that, <laughs> it doesn't work out. Like invest in real estate, invest in, I would say stocks, but Jesus, we've seen what's going on with those lately. There are, there are far better investments to make than records. You know, find something that is increasing steadily and slowly is 6% or whatever the, the, the API, right, is on something. Don't buy records or comic books or shoes or toys or any other weird collectible, like, for that reason. Invest certainly in quality of life, you know, I, and that's ultimately what I see. I see, like, buying records for a good reason, which is to listen to and enjoy and sort of 
deepen and further your understanding of the music itself. And then there's rec buying records for what I would call bad reasons, uh, you know, showing off on Instagram or fucking, you know, getting in some weird like macho competition thing with someone or investing, you know. Whatever your, re your bad reason for buying records are, I kind of just see it all as the same and it is all just boring <laughs> to me and tedious, no matter what level of bad it is. And like, probably working against my best interest by saying this as someone who's selling these records, I'm just being honest with you guys. They're not, invest if, if you care about money, invest better. If you care about your quality of life and want to enjoy things, certainly records are great. Do that, but don't look for it for finance. And as for what they're called, what, you know, if people are doing one or the others, unfortunately, I see a lot of people buying records not for really particularly great or pure reasons, unfortunately. But again, that's also the case with everything. Imagine comic book collecting. They buy these comics that are amazing art created by human hands and are beautiful artifacts and can enrich your life. They put them in slabs, put them in plastic slabs so you can't read them. Thankfully, records haven't gotten to that point. But that's that kind of mentality, which I think is very foolish. Bad investment. All right, and that was our questions for the day. Thanks everyone who left a question. If you wanna see your question answered on next week's vid, leave a comment, ideally on YouTube, but I'll take them how I can get them. And uh, thanks very much, it's been very fun. I'll see you guys later, bye. Fun stuff, right?